Da? Jaz, Roberto, zda? Su? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I'm just pulling up the slide thing again, the slide presentation, let me see. No, wait, too much. Uh-huh, okay. You have some internet problems, but it will go, it will go. Okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, introduce you again. So, pravi so sisli psihiatrija Roberto Pikerink je pa pacient, ki se zdravi s konopljo zaradi PTSD-a. To je čas, ko se naloži. Aha. Okay, you can start now. Okay. Perfect. Um, Sir, are you there? Here. Yeah, hey, Roberto, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. All right, we're on with the group. Let me just see. I have my slides here, and then they just disappear. Let's see what happens. Um, one second, you guys. Let's see. funding. 
Um, so ultimately, we were when we were tossed out, we were lucky to have a lot of good physicians that came forward to try to defend this work. Um, and and they really opened it. There were many people who used this as an attack on scientific freedom. But the good news is we ended up with tons of free media coverage. You know, the study and and what happened was people became aware about the barriers to cannabis research. So that's why if, if the government there is, is questioning that there's not enough studies, um, there's a, a reason why the government has systematically blocked this work for many decades. But luckily we ended up with our own institute, so now we're happily independent. We're doing the work at a, a private institute in Arizona where we, we don't work with any universities or hospitals. But after being terminated from the university, we ended up with this $2 million grant and the, the money from the state of Colorado also went to fund cannabis research in all of these different areas. So I wanted to give you some hope that in the next few years, um, the, the state of Colorado is funding research in all of these different areas. So you're gonna, in the next three years, you're gonna have published data about cannabis for um, Parkinson's disease, cannabis for pediatric brain tumors, all this stuff is, is being studied right now by my colleagues. Um, so uh, this, the reason we've been fighting so hard for this study is because it's the first and only randomized controlled trial in the world looking at cannabis for PTSD. Um, this is a DEA Schedule One license. So many of you are wondering, well, you know, how do I get to this? This is Basically, the DEA has given me uh, a researcher license to, to purchase cannabis. So this is what scientists call this the golden ticket. It allows me the privilege of purchasing cannabis from the federal government. But this is what it looks like. So you would think we ordered eight kilos, eight kilograms of cannabis from the US government. And you would think that it would come like in some kind of armored truck or no, it just arrived by FedEx. The guy had no idea he was transporting marijuana. Um, he was completely stunned. But this is what it looks like, right? It comes to the scientists frozen in these sandwich bags, basically. These are little Ziploc bags. It's frozen. We pour it out. It's basically like a green powder. I mean, I'm sure, you know, from what your uh, impressions or what cannabis <laughs> look like, most people look at that and they don't even believe it's cannabis, um, but this is how they standardize the cannabis. They take different strains and they blend them into this powder, um, and this is what we're forced to work with. So this is the only federally legal supply of marijuana for any of these controlled trials. So I just wanted to show that to you because I want you to see the way that the government is, you know, potentially sabotaging this work. You know, because we're forced to use this and this only, um, that you, if you're trying to study the effectiveness of cannabis and you're forced to start with this material, you know, I just want to point out, you know, one thing is, you know, cannabis has been in the U.S. pharmacopoeia since the 1800s. So, and one thing that was interesting about when I, when we were studying this, I realized that even back then in, in, in the, even as far back as the 1800s, the medical community recognized that cannabis could be effective in all of these areas. Um, and you can see, I particularly want you to pay, um, I especially wanted to point out the need, the idea of cannabis for <coughs> opioid addiction, right? So that's something that we're currently designing a clinical trial to study cannabis as a substitution for, for pain pills, for heroin. Um, it also mentions alcoholism, that it could be a substitution therapy for alcoholics, and that's something Roberto is gonna talk with you about that a little bit more. But I'm just gonna tell you about how we ended up here. The reason I got interested in cannabis for PTSD is because of the veterans in my practice. I've been taking care of vets for 20 years, and they claimed that they were getting benefit <coughs> for marijuana in all these different areas, right? That it was helping their sleep, helping their nightmares, helping their anxiety. So we started to, um, you know, see this epidemic of veteran suicide in, in the U.S. We lose 
22, well, the, the, the data changes year to year, but it's about 20 to 22 veterans each day kill themselves in the U.S. And we think that that's related to un undertreated post-traumatic stress disorder. That's actually a picture of Roberto there at the top. That's him in, um, you know, when he was in his military service. But this data is incredibly depressing, you know, that we lose that many veterans to suicide. We don't have any good treatment for PTSD. And so I think that, you know, I, I, want, I wonder if cannabis could help curb this epidemic of veteran suicide, which really should be considered a public health crisis. But it's not, the government isn't really doing anything about this. And these are the only two FDA approved medications that we have for PTSD. We just have Zoloft and Paxil. And so when those fail, you know, the media is starting to realize that these medications are really not much better than placebo, you know? So when those medications fail, we move to all these other meds. Look at all this whole pile. This is a mountain of psychiatric medication. All of these are allowed to be used off-label to treat PTSD. You can see all the sleep meds, all of the medications for bipolar disorder, you know, all the, the seizure meds, all of these other meds for different classes. You see, you can see why the veterans, all these antipsychotics, all of these meds have so many terrible side effects. They're brutal, and that's why these veterans start feeling like guinea pigs, you know? Um, so that's how we got into this. You know, we've, the U.S. has become the prescription overdose capital of the, of the world now. We lose um, a person to prescription drug overdose every 19 minutes. Somebody dies from this. So in, in the veteran community, among our military veterans, they have a 33% higher rate of prescription drug overdose, partly because we give them so many pills to use. We did have this JAMA article. Many of you guys have seen this article from um, 2014 where they managed to, they, they evaluated all the 23 medical marijuana states in the U.S. and they found that they're on average there was a 25% reduction in opioid overdose deaths um, in those states that had legal cannabis available to them. So what we're seeing is that in states where medical marijuana is legally available, the patients are choosing that as a safer alternative to all the opioids and other things that can kill them. The other thing that's compelling is that but there's two you know, governments, both Israel and Canada, cover the cost of their veterans' cannabis as any other medicine. And I think that's the right approach. You know, this medicine, this is the group, I'll show you the group in Canada. These, these are, this is a charity called Marijuana for Trauma, and all these Canadian veterans are teaching each other how to use cannabis because they know they're not going to get that good information from the physician. So they're basically, you know, teaching each other, coaching each other on how to use this plan. And this is, you know, a picture that one of my veterans, you know, it's a really good illustration. He, he described his experience with cannabis, that he was drowning in pills and pill bottles and finally discovered um, this role, you know, the, in this case, a joint that he found life-saving. And that's the words that so many of these veterans use. They describe cannabis as saving their life. And I think we really owe it to them to study this plant in a rigorous way. Now, I'm just gonna show you real quickly, I'm just gonna take one minute to show you an example of some of the research already available about <coughs> cannabis as a medicine. Um, you can see here, this is a, a commonly used <coughs> comparison where they talk about the ginormous amount of, of uh, scientific articles about cannabis compared to all these other drugs that are already on the market. But let me just give you a glimpse of some of the articles on cannabis for PTSD. This is the Journal of Neuroscience, 2009. This is, in 2009, they already had legitimate data about cannabis helping to, um, to, to suppress negative memories, you know, and help reduce the anxiety. So that you see all these, even back in 2002, Nature was talking about how um, endocannabinoids seem to play a role in suppressing memories. 
Um, let's see what else we have here. Oh, this might be slowing down here. Uh-oh. I might have lost the picture here. But anyway, I was going to show you. It might take a second to pull up. But I'm going to I wanted to show you one of the most important articles in this list is um, from last year, one of our colleagues followed 80 veterans through the New Mexico medical cannabis program. So in New Mexico, they have a legal, that, that it's legal for patients to access marijuana. And 80 veterans were, were studied um, over the course of a year. And what they found was a, they, they monitored the severity of their post-traumatic stress disorder, the PTSD, and they found a 75% reduction in PTSD symptoms using just cannabis alone. So I, this was a data that was published in a peer-reviewed medical journal, and, um, and it really proved to us that we are on the right track with this. I'm not sure why it's not coming up, but I think what I'd like to do now is toss it over to Roberto. Let me, um, one second here, let me, let me put Roberto on here. I'm just gonna pull up his slides real quick. Uh, let's see here. Okay, one second, and then we'll, um, th this is a perfect time to let him jump in and talk about his own experience. So you're gonna hear now from, from a vet who's been dealing with this firsthand. Um, all right, Roberto, are you still on with us? Yeah, I'm here, oh, I'll let you that's Roberto. I'm gonna just put it on his first slide and then, um, all right, Roberto, you go ahead and talk and I'll, I'll move the slides for you. Uh, thank you for having us on, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry about our uh, you know, American technical difficulties on this end. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, my name is Roberto Pickering. I'm a 100% disabled uh, Marine Corps combat veteran. Uh, I'm currently the co-founder of the Battlefield Foundation, which is a suicide prevention campaign and non opiate based relief through cannabis therapies, uh, focusing on raising money for clinical trials uh, in this space. I'm also a, a partner at Brightside Holdings, which is essentially an all services management company for the cannabis industry, uh, focusing on cultivation, product development, of cannabis into strain specific medication uh, for the masses. Um, um, Sue, can you can you go to the next one, please? Yeah, yeah. So my a little of my personal story here. Um, I served in the Iraqi War as a sniper in two thousand and three to two thousand and four. Um, when I came back from war, I was in a really bad place in my head. Uh, I almost took my life a couple of years after the war there. I was self-medicating uh, very heavily with alcohol and developed alcoholism. And uh, I didn't know what PTSD was. I was fortunate enough to have a good family and friends and support system that were able to get me into a program at the VA in Palo Alto of which I completed a, a 90 day inpatient program and was diagnosed 100% disabled for PTSD. Uh, while at the VA, I was prescribed 13 different medications to manage uh, my various symptoms, uh, insomnia, anxiety, and such and so forth. Um, needless to say, this made my life exponentially worse in, in them trying to help me and uh, I hadn't stopped drinking at that point either. So having 13 different medications in your body uh, coupled with alcohol, you know, I, it might sound crazy that that seemed normal to me at that time in my life, but um, you veterans are very, uh, you know, orders oriented, if you will, and we listen to our physicians. And the physicians at the VA, in my opinion, uh, very much over-prescribe medication and don't take into the don't take in the um, the fact that we don't know how that many medications can affect in your body, especially when, when coupled with alcohol. Uh, uh, a lot of these medications, uh, psych meds, uh, having the symptoms listed as suicide being one of the most detrimental symptoms. So pretty awful when you're trying to come out of a depressive state and the, the medications you're taking list 
suicide is a potential harmful side effect. Some dark humor there. But uh, with the help of marijuana, I then I, I was exposed to it through a, a friend of mine's father, who was a black market grower at that time, 12 years ago in California, and suggested that I use it and try to come off of these meds. And I, I realized that, and I've known this from earlier in my life, but when I, when I smoked marijuana, I, I never had the urge to drink alcohol. So I, uh, in my, my trying to quit drinking, I started to use marijuana. I was very successful in being able to stop drinking alcohol to this day. And uh, I attribute that to cannabis. Uh, I was also able to get a full night's sleep. And lo and behold, I was then over the next few years able to come off of all of those 13 different medications. And today I don't drink and I am not on any prescription pills. So I'm very passionate about this plant. So Sue, uh, maybe the next slide. <coughs> so a, a little of what I feel like we need to focus on, uh, as this is very much a political movement, uh, as it is a medical movement and a, a systematic problem at that. Um, so the, the Battlefield Foundation, uh, our focus, Sue and I came together. Uh, she's my best friend and we've come together as kind of doctor and patient duo here. And we're now uh, advocating for efficacy clinical trials in the cannabis space to, to lend this medicine real credibility and focusing on uh, myself being an entrepreneur in the cannabis space for the last decade, I've been focusing on getting uh, these businesses to responsibly give back and provide funding for these much needed uh, clinical trials. Uh, there's also a huge opportunity for creating uh, various employment opportunities for veterans within the cannabis industry. Uh, I myself, um, you know, being an example of that, I, you know, through the wreckage of my past and, and essentially being the basket case that I was early on coming back from war, you know, I, I, Google wasn't hiring, if you will. I didn't have a, a stellar resume. So I needed a place to find gainful employment, uh, provide a life for myself, and I really found a lot of comfort in that. You know, PTSD being a form of, or being a condition of isolation, I found a lot of comfort and making a living for myself in grow rooms and and watching your watching your the fruits of your labor you know provide a living for yourself and and i've been able to successfully pass that model down to other veterans i i'll leave you with this i think there's just as much uh, there's just as much medication in being able to bring home a, a meaningful check for your family and get off of the the, the va's prescription pills as opposed to uh, the former years of my life where I was sitting on the couch on disability pay and uh, eating, those, eating those pills. So uh, it's, it's, it's a whole reintegration process. And I think that this, the cannabis industry as a whole uh, leans itself to that uh, as we've all struggled and continue to struggle. And thank you all for your efforts uh, getting to this point. So thank you for letting me, uh, letting me share my story. And if there's any questions you, you guys may have, I'm, Please ask me anything. Thank you very much. That was great, Roberto. Yeah, Good job, man. I, um, yeah, I think, I mean, you can see why. This is a very unlikely friendship, but he is my best buddy. Roberto and I travel around the world talking about this issue because we think it's so important that um, people hear of it from a, uh, you know, hear about his experience and, and hear about the work that we're doing. The study is currently enrolling veterans. We have about 50, 50 more veterans to go before we can, um, can finalize the study and publish the data. So we're about probably two years away from having published data on this issue, but I, I really look forward to, to, to sharing that with you. It, this is a, a triple blind study, just so you know. Everyone is blinded in the study, so it's a very rigorous trial, and it'll give us some really good objective data on how cannabis is working, even though, you know, uh, granted that we are forced to use this sort of substandard marijuana, nothing close to what um, Bojo has access to, <laughs> but it's still, um, 
it's still something, it's a start, and uh, we're looking forward to, to bringing that to you eventually. I don't know, Koshi, do you think we can take a question, or is it too hard to do that? Uh, uh, yes, you can pick up some questions, but uh, mostly questions we will do tomorrow on the workshops, okay? But uh, now okay. you can also yeah. answer some questions, of course. Hi, this is Lee. It's Dr. Bob here. I just want to, it's very important, I think, that we, you and I uh, and, and Roberto get in touch. Uh, I'm involved in a project in Colorado where we've acquired a unique piece of land that has unique zoning, and we're able to build housing on it for veterans where we expect the VA will fund the entire house. And by the way, we've constructed the whole thing, and by virtue of unique zoning, we're going to have cannabis farms that are going to be allocated to each of the can each of the veterans who will buy the house paid for by the government, and in turn, each one of them will make at least $100,000 a year off the community cannabis that we're going to be doing by virtue of the mechanism we put in place. So it would be great to get together with you on this situation. Ah. I love that idea. Wow, that sounds terrific. We will definitely yeah. connect after this and, and talk about the possibilities. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you, Bob. That's, that's absolutely wonderful. Well, we want people like you to be there. We, we want people like you to be a member of that community where you teach them to grow, where everybody's helping one another, and we move forward. Absolutely, absolutely, and I, I very much look forward to following up with you on that conversation. Thank you again for your work. All right, all right. Well, we'll let you. We'll, we'll see everybody tomorrow then, I guess. Uh, yes, but it will be uh, a little bit earlier than uh, today. Okay, I will let okay, you know you on uh, <laughs> on email. Yeah, thanks, you guys. Appreciate everybody. Okay, thank you, Sue. See you tomorrow. Thank you guys so much for your efforts. Take care. Okay. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Okay, to je to, Bože. Za kluče. Za danas. A ne, še bomo potem pa... Če mak do kakov vprašanja. I did not prepare last week for this uh, discussion because I didn't know before a lot about cannabis. I was studying pharmacy 20 years ago and of course I didn't learn anything about the endocannabinoid system. My asking is uh, where can I find, because I was on the faculty last week and I didn't find any information about the mechanism uh, which are uh, I saw today uh, y you found and you know something about this where can I get information about this thank you and the second one uh, uh, it's for the question for different countries how many information we can find uh, about cannabis today the pharmacopoeia uh, in Europe, uh, Europica, I don't know how it is English, we can't find it a lot. Uh, what about for the last pharmaco pharmacopoeia of Spain or Germany or on the States? It's my question, thank you. Uh, well, maybe other people can also provide answers. Uh, regarding information about uh, the endocannabinoid system, uh, one possible source would be the International Association for Cannabis as Medicines, so IACM. So they have a website that is very complete with information in different languages, and they have a very good summary of the different actions of, of cannabinoids in general. And probably you can also get their uh, links to publications or reviews where you can find information. Obviously, we, I can send you reviews so you can have more information about the endocannabinoid system. And, I mean, there is a lot of information available, but probably in this website, you have something that is not so scientific, it's more for general public too, and maybe it would, would be easier to understand as a first step, and then maybe you can go into deeper details. But you were right that normally in the schools of medicines, 
the endocrine system is not is not taught. And the truth is that it is a very important system in the central nervous system too. And, and it's the main key, key protein couple receptor in the central nervous system. It's in many different synapses, it regulates many physiological functions. And it's, it's very odd that it's not very explained in, in the faculties of medicine, for instance. So that's something that has to be definitely modified. And then the second question was about uh, the pharmacopoeia. Yes. I think in, it's true that in every, every different country, maybe some other people can, can also explain it. In each country, you may have differences. But for instance, also in this website, I think you can find information because uh, in some countries, you have authorized uh, officially, for instance, side effects for some applications. In some other states, under clinical trials, then you have the other medicines that are authorized. But there are also some countries now, like maybe Canada or Uruguay or other countries where well, medical cannabis is starting to be authorized too, so there is a lot of variability. I think it's good to check in central central place. I mean, someone else can can answer. Uh, hello, uh, maybe I can answer uh, this last question. Uh, I'm uh, from Faculty of Pharmacy, uh, this university in Ljubljana, and. Um, uh, as I know, uh, uh, European pharmacopoeia. Yeah. Aha, okay. Uh, po v Slovenščini, v glavnem Evropska farmakopeja uh, pripravila monografijo o kanabis uh, FLOS, pač za cvet konople, uh, kakor mi je pa znano, se bo pa tudi začel pripravljati za ekstrakte kanabisa. Uh, trenutno ni, bilo je v Jugoslovanski farmakopeji, pa se je ukinil, um, pa uh, dat da, stale uh, Deutsche Arzneimittel Kodex ma monografijo za pripravo magistralnih receptur. A se dobiše kaj druzna na fakulteti za farmacijo, <coughs> recimo pa farmacijotski kemiji 3, me zanima? Mislim, da se uh, počas, uh, na, uh, jaz sem iz katedre za farmacijotsko biologijo, na farmakognoziji, mi počas začenjamo uh, delati na predavanjih, uh, pa mislim, da se bo tudi pri drugih predmetih uh, vedno več omenjali. Se pravi, mehanizmi delovanja se na fakulteti še niso prav noč omenjali. Jaz, namreč, na internetu sem nekaj našla, želela bi si strokovnih razlag, uh, zato sem šla na fakulteto, da pogledam, kaj obstaja. Uh, ker pač sem bila navdušena nad predavanjem Tanje Bagar. Tanja Bagar se mi zdi, da se najbolj približa tisti strokovni razlagi, ki bi jo lahko tudi farmacirti oziroma zdravniki nekako akceptirali v Sloveniji. Ne? Zdaj zato je ne vem, ampak tukaj sem se zdaj pač malo posvetila. Se pravi, trenutno ni možno dobiti nič. Pa ne bi rekla, jaz sem imela prejšnji tedna na predavanje. Aha, no pa se da dobiti to predavanje kaj več? Ne mislite predstavitev ali kaj? Ja. Ja. Lahko vam dam vizitko, pa se pa izmenim. Ja, hvala. Ja. And, um, and there is, if you go online, there is 792 pages of it um, at the, at the European Pharmacopeia. I know, but what, is, but what can you find about this? Uh, I was looking last week, I mean, European 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 so maybe not, you know, and the libraries have a lending system. So in fact, if you went to a very large library here, that library can import from, for you for, I don't know, a period of two weeks, maybe you cannot take it out, but they will import for you all the documents uh, or copies of. So that's another system that I'll, I'll show you later. Thank you. So, so there's something very important happening in the United States right now. There's a woman, Lynn Wedower, who back in the day received a salt vaccine and there were a number of vaccines when they were early produced in particular that were contaminated by a monkey virus, SV40, which causes cancer. 
And as a consequence, she was actually the first federal patient in the United States. And special laws were made to keep it all secret. And um, that secrecy has now run out. But this is a very highly intelligent woman. In fact, she is the United States ambassador for autism as a consequence of what she learned with her children as a consequence of her experiences. In any event, what she's done is she's compiled out of the old literature essentially a physician desk reference for cannabis. And because she's plugged into the federal government, she's already brought it to the FDA to look at what she's done. And they don't see any problems with what she's done because what's going con the consequence of this will be that it will become recognized as grass and it will be grandfathered in the same way as aspirin was because we have all the human data from the United States and from around the world of its medical use in people. And all it does is support everything we now know. So this is going to be a big event. The publication is supposed to be, I think, in July. So uh, make sure everybody gets a copy. <laughs> Zdravo, Andrej Gosenca, tukaj. Jaz sem danes tukaj zaradi tega, ker pač išče majo eno zdravilo za moja žena, ki je bila pri dveh pestih diagnosticirana multipla skleroza. In zdaj pač to je na samem začetku. In me zdaj zanima, če bi kdo od teh tukaj, ki so bili danes lahko predlajal karkoli, ne ima li to kanabis, sativa ali drugega recimo. To me predvsem, kaj me zanima. Zdaj, ne vem. In jim ti še gen. Oh. Okay, hello uh, again uh, in English. Uh, my wife was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and uh, we're just on the beginning of this disease and uh, we're just looking for something what, what to start with. I'm uh, willing to uh, start using cannabis but I don't know what, where to find, how many or something like this. I don't know. There's somebody that could answer this. <laughs> You've got somebody here in fact who cured himself with multiple sclerosis. Unless I didn't. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Dobar dan svima. Hvala je pravi. Moje ime je Juanito. Dolazim iz Hrvatske, odnosno Opatije. So, some of you know me. I'm Juanito coming from Croatia, Opatija. Imam multiplu sklerozu. Diagnosticiran u 2008. kad sam imao 30 godina, ali prvi simptomi su počeli još kad sam imao 16 godina. Eto, bez krepatnje, do 30. godine, dok nisam saznao što imam, da se znam tome posvetit. Onda sam isprobavao konvencijalnu medicinu, koja mi, nažalost, nije ništa pomogla. A onda 2011. došao je Rik Simpson u Opatiju, ispričao znanje o konoplji i kako si možemo pomoći ili pokušati pomoći sa konopljom ili kanabisom ili marihuanom, ako hoće vam baš tako. I ja sam to napravio, što je čovjek rekao da je najbolje, da je najbolje uzgojiti svoju konoplju, napraviti ekstrakt, pojest u miru, puno spavat, mirovati i jednostavno slušati svoje tijelo. Znači kad vas pita pit vodu ili tekućinu, jest, komunicirati koliko vam se da u mirnom okruženju. Ja sam to napravio, evo, danas sam ovdje, da vam kažem da sam si spasio život. Pitanje, najviše pitanja od pacijenata, od oboljelih koji bi si želi pomoć za multiplu sklerozu, znači, na koji način pristupiti konoplji, koji su to sorte i da li pušenje, da li ekstrakt ili bilo koji drugi način. 
Ja sam počeo sa ekstraktom konoplje, znači to je u biti smola. I to sam jeo, oralno. Ima više načina, može se inhaliranjem ili pušenjem, apliciranjem na desni, čepići ili supozitoriji, rektalna ili analna brini. Može naravno i vaginalno. Ili aplaciranjem na rane, ili na bolna mjesta, ili čak spazme, znači apliciranje kožu. Isprobao sam sve načine, ali onaj prvi način koji meni pomogao je oralno konzumiranje. Na taj način konzumiranja vam daje efekt puno spavanja, što je jako bilo dobro, jer sam imao problem sa spavanjem. To su sorte koji su, to su indika sorte, znači postoje tri podvrste konopne. Ja sam počeo sa indikom, kako je bilo i preporučeno na samom predavanju, sa većim udjelom THC-a. Kupio sam tako sjeme, baš upravo ovdje u Ljubljani. Bacio sam u zemlju sjeme i to je to. Kad je konoplje zdravstva poslušao, napravio je ekstrakt i jeo. Znači to su indika sorte koje nam daju informaciju u tijelu, gledaj, bolje ti je sjest, mirovat u svom mirnom okruženju. Međutim... Znači si aktivirao od seba da je THC? Decarboxylation? Da, da, naravno, naravno, naravno. Znači, kad je konoplje izrasla, kad je sazrijela, krajem desetog mjeseca, stavio sam je, znači, porezo ili pokupio, kako ga zovete, stavio sam je u suho, mračno mjesto dva tjedna, sa otapalom sam je ispro 3 do 4 minute, iskuhao sam to u doslovcim električnom loncu ili kuhao za rižu, i to je to, znači, kroz to iskuhavanje, prolazi se dekarboksilacija, a vjerujem da profesor Paul Hoenby puno konkretnije može više o tome. Znači, ja sam pristupio konoplji da je čovjek ispričao priču, što je najbolje napraviti. Ja sam samo napravio što je čovjek ispričao i nisam se nikad zamarao nešto više od toga, dok nisam vidio da sam na pravom putu da mi zaista pomaže konoplja, pa sam onda tek počeo ići se educirati zašto mi konoplje pomaže, i dugoročno sam gledao i proučavao sam sebe da mi ne odmaže. Znači, da mi dugoročno non stop pomaže. I ono što se pokazalo i testirao sam na sam sebi, znači da li stvara ovisnost ili neke druge negativne efekte po bilo kojem drugom pitanju. Znači, pokazalo se samo dobro u svakom smislu. Možemo govoriti više o sortama, znači, Postoje više sorti konoplje ili podvrste, znači tri osnovne podvrste i tisuće sorti. I sorta koja meni pomaže, ne mora tebi, ali može nekom trećem još bolje nego meni. Znači, jer imamo sorte koje imaju veći udij od CBD-a, a manji udij od THC-a. Tako da ima ljudi sa multiplom sklerozom kojima pomažu takve sorte. Kad gledam kao pacijent nove oboljele koje danas dobivaju dijagnozu multiple skleroze i kako bi pristupio njima, odnosno kako bi volio da tada netko je mogao pristupiti meni, znači koji nisam ništa znao o konopi, ni o jointu, ni o pušenju, znači definitivno polagano, znači ne prenaglo, znači to je konoplja je zaista moćna biljka i mislim da bi je mogli koristiti sa poštovanjem u prvom smislu. Pogotovo mi oboljeni, koji si želimo pomoć. Znači, da slušamo nekog drugog koji ima znanje. Znači, jednostavno, to je vrijedno znanje pacijenata koje mi želimo podijeliti sa oboljelima, a mnogi oboljeli žele raditi kako oni žele raditi. Znači, ne može se konzumirati visoko kvalitetan ekstrakt konoplje, nema veze da li je to sa većim udijom THC ili CBD-a u nemeru ili ako oboljeli nije u mirnom okruženju. Znači, mirno okruženje je jako bitno. Znači, ne može se raditi ozbiljan posao 8 sati ili 10 i konzumirati bilo kakav ekstrakt ili bilo koji drugi lijek. Svaki liječnik kad vam kaže da bolje da vam bolovanje, uputnicu, miru i doma i uzimaj lijek. Tako isto i sa konopljom, jer mnogi misle da je to čudotvojan lijek, da ćemo sutra ovaj ozdraviti. Daj Bože, dešavaju se čuda, ja vjerujem isto u čuda i doživljavam, ja sam jedno čudo sam za sebe. Tako doživljavam.
Well, how, how, how bad were you? Well, I was so bad that I couldn't get out of the bed. <laughs> Alright, so they understand how significant this is. Many people, many people around me forget. I can jump, I can jump. I was sometimes from 16 to 22 years old, I jumped a marathon. And then for 30 years, I had a period where I didn't get out of the bed. From 2 to 3 hours. Multiple sclerosis is about 1,000 people. These are spasms, that they have information that you have 10 to 10 or more kilograms in your legs and you can't move the legs, you can't move the legs or even the legs. So that is the wrong information in the brain. You can define it as a spasm, but that is a lot of the wrong information in the brain. That's why it's called multiple sclerosis. I'm going to tell you that people forget about me, that I can't move the legs in the brain, that I can't move the legs in the brain, that I can't move the legs in the brain, that I can't move the legs, да се направи преку пети со чекчени хубо да на себе, значи тоа е еден доста целен стрес, ги видите спават, знаеќи да имате симптоми од шеснаесте години, а да таа да се има тридесет години, ми е сам свестен со тоа велика оштетување. Доста се мултипла склероза, кој е узрок? Ти со чија узрок? Не битно кој е узрок, али конопле помаже, хем хелпс, дефинитивно, со од водеве, марихуана. It doesn't matter, it helps. Še kakšno vprašanje? Če ne, potem je to to za danes. Božo še. Jaz bi se zahvalil vsem vam, ki ste prišli, Slavko, ki je ves dan nam pomagal vodi tole in vsem tistim, ki so nam pomagali. Za jutri, kdo bo to, bi vse samo rad opozoril, ki bo rok svetek naredil tudi eno konopljeno malico za vse skupaj, tako boste nekaj toplega iz konopljenih jedi zgorali.